Why hello you people from Earth and Outer Space. It is I, Alexander from the Universe. In this episode of Let's Trust, we'll contemplate the meaning of variable bindings. Variables are featured by many programming languages and especially by systems languages. Now in Rust, there is something slap bit different from regular variables, you know, the whole mathematics variables thing, whereas a variable is a name corresponding to a value. Rust's got variable bindings, which are not identical. They're quite similar, but they're a whole lot more powerful. You create variable bindings by using the keyword let, L-E-T. So you let something be equal to something. We're gonna create a variable binding named X. We're gonna set it equal to a number like, well, it's gotta be contained by the Fibonacci sequence. Let's go with five and end it by a semicolon. X now has the value of five. But hey, this variable binding doesn't specify type. So how on earth will the Rust compiler know that this variable binding is an integer? Because this clearly is an integer. It's got the value of five, it's a whole number, and uh, can be either negative or positive, that's an integer. But how does the compiler know that in Rust, there's something called type inference, which is usually present in higher level languages, such as Python, or might I say JavaScript. And um, Rust got that too, which is really cool for a systems language. Uh, this means that upon runtime, Rust is gonna figure out the types of all variable bindings. There is, however, a way that we can explicitly type in a type. Uh, if we want to make sure that this type is of, say, an i32, which is a 32-bit integer, we can type in a colon after the binding name, and then type i32, so an integer stored inside 32 bits. Now, we're being very clear to the Rust compiler, because the Rust compiler really doesn't care if we do this. It's going to figure that out on its own anyway. Uh, now, there are times when we might want to store a variable binding and say just one single byte and then we can go for i8 which is also a variable type there is the i8 i16 i32 and i64 all with different bit sizes so the i8 consists of eight bits and our x binding stores the value of five now let's remove that because that's that seems really silly we don't need that right now but what if we wanted to change this value like what if we wanted to set the x to something new. There are two different ways in which we can accomplish this task. It's either by overriding the current binding name x by typing in another let with the same name x is equal to 8 for example. Now this binding, binding x to 5, this no longer exists. x now has the value of 8. What if we wanted to change the current one, like a regular change? We just wanted to change the x to something. Then what we could do is we could type in x equals 8, but this is going to generate as an error. Like if we were to run this like so inside our cargo project here, uh, we do cargo run. It's going to say this, reassignment of immutable variable. By default in Rust, all variable bindings are immutable, meaning that they cannot be changed in value. This is due to Rust's very safe nature. For the less the user can do, really the less the user can mess up, because <laughs> programmers are really bad at not messing up at some point anyway. So in order to change this value to eight, we can make this binary immutable by typing in mut here after the let, let mut x equal five. This means that let a mutable bind an x. So we're explicitly make this x binding mutable. And we're giving it the value of five. If we were to compile this now, like so, cargo run, it's gonna say, hey, it works. Wonderful, that's beautiful. But this doesn't seem more powerful than regular regular variables, does it? 
in order for us to show part of the potential of this, we can, for example, define multiple variables at the same time, multiple variable bindings at the same time, introduce multiple bindings at the same time, but typing these, making a parenthesis here instead, typing, for example, x, y, and then setting it equal to something called a tuple, which we'll discuss later. Uh, we're gonna, and we're gonna type in some values, say 13 and 21. And um, what this will do is define both an X binding and a Y binding. Uh, the X was value set to 13, the Y was value set to 21. And this is gonna work perfectly fine. Bam! Now, there is one thing here. If we wanted to use type annotations for this and we wanna make it explicitly a certain type, what we had to do is define the type over here, type in a colon, and inside the brackets like so, type, for example, i32 and i8. If we run this now, you're gonna see this works perfectly fine. So now the first binding here, X, has the type of I32, and the Y binding has the type of I8. And this is only part of the, and this is only, and this is only part of the power of variable bindings. Uh, there are a whole lot of things you can do with variable bindings. And this is definitely one of Rust's most brilliant features that make Rust the language it is. And this is definitely one of, and this is definitely one of those really cool features that Rust has, comparing it to other programming languages and something that makes it really modern. Because what's in here is not actually the variable name, it's actually a pattern. That's the reason we can do things like that and set it equal to set two variable bindings and set two variables equal to something at the same time. Uh, but we're gonna have to do it like this. And something to notice about variable naming when naming your bindings is that your variable binding names are written in snake case. So snake case is like Lowercase snake case, written. Lowercase snake case, like so. Uh, we have everything's lowercase. When there is a blank space, we use uh, an underscore in order for it to, by convention. The next time around, we're gonna have a look at how we can print those out in the, into the console, because it's not as simple as just making a print line and putting the variable in there. It's actually a more brilliant solution that looks a lot like higher level languages, but it's not, because it's like, it's, it's really, it's low level, but it's it's high level. It's, it's, it's like a combination between two worlds. It's amazing. <laughs> Holy crap, man. Why goodbye, you people from Earth and outer space? Feel free to leave a comment stating something. Why goodbye, you people from Earth and outer space? Feel free to leave a comment stating something utterly hilarious or perhaps even a like. Until next time. Until next time. Until next time. <laughs>